This one currently has some lead acid batteries running a freezer and a refrigerator. your eye protection. Now, I wear glasses, which is partly protective, but it's better to still have these. These will protect you even more from debris, which might go in between your glasses to your eye. So I'm gonna put some, this is, I just use 5W30 oil. So I'll oil up my drill. Now, I tried to go from the, start with the number 30 drill, it's very small, then I went up to the number 12 drill, which is 0.199 inches, so I went from 0.128 to 0.199 inches, then I just tried to jump straight up to the F drill, I should have known better, but I was being a little too aggressive. So. I'm going to now go to a smaller intermediate drill, the number one drill. Number one, something like stainless steel or some hardened steel where it's obvious that it's gonna be a hard metal to cut. Copper is not obvious that it should be a hard metal to cut for, for a beginner. And the reason for that is you think copper is soft, therefore it's probably easy to drill but that's not the case. Um, what happens is, because it's very soft and gummy, it tends to grab the tool. And when it grabs the tool, it suddenly increases the force on the drill and it's a feedback mechanism. And it can shatter the drill or do all kinds of problems, break the part. step to have a step drill in the drill in the That's really important. You don't want your machine, which in this case is a very small light drill press, to be struggling with the cutting. And the whole machine starts shaking and the vise starts shaking. So those are sort of the machine talking to you and telling you that you can't handle it. This is sort of like the limit of what stage should be useful because with metal there's less clay available than with wood.
This needs to sit for a couple of days, <clears throat> equilibrating the cells. Make sure you connect the negatives to negatives and positives to positives because you're still equilibrating first and you're not assembling the final battery. Okay. This here is my uh, battery pack. That's um, it's about one and a half kilowatt hours, although it's closer to 1.7 kilowatt hours. Now, these have been equilibrating for quite some time, and this prevents a casual touch um, between this bus bar and the center. Even though this is a current sense bar, it's still possibly high current if you uh, were to touch something here or here. Okay, now this is the final, I'm gonna try it out here. I've connected it to my Victron board. And this is the solar charging in, but I have to, so you can't re-enable output. To do is short these two together with a wire. This is one of my special shorting wires. This is gonna make a bit of a spark, but it's okay. It didn't make a spark, but it has started the battery, and I can tell because 14.6 volts. So it's fairly discharged. It's detecting low battery. So when that charges up, it'll the Spartan will re-engage. And I have set it to 14.8 is the cutoff low, 16.1 is the cut high. And in fact, I'm going to raise that up a little bit. To request 16.2 and then I'm going to lower the threshold for cut off at 15.3 so in the future it won't even allow it to drop to 14.7 I uh, changed a little bit I took the BMS and instead of having a tape to the side of the battery I put a Anderson connector on it so I can actually disconnect and reconnect BMS's um, to try out different BMS's and here's my other battery here I'm gonna put this stick this up here so you can see better now this big one I have been charging it here it's a very, very big battery so it takes a long time to charge up I've got the uh, custom settings on the Renogy so it's a user-defined battery. The good part about that particular MPPT controller is that you can create arbitrary batteries in it. So I have it charging up to 16.6 volts. And if it, um, and I have a hard cutoff or disconnect at 16.8 volts, although 16.6 is pretty much as high as I'm willing to take it. Uh, the BMS should cut off somewhere there too at some point. If the voltage is too low or below a certain threshold, it switches to an alternative power source, which in case here is the wall. And if the voltage is high enough in the battery, then it goes to the inverter and takes power from the inverter. Um, so far, it, I think it'll work fine. That's Those are the numbers I use for my refrigerator. Yeah, the 4S3P um, battery instead of the 4S6P battery that I'm building now. So those settings work fine on that battery. So now I'm going to just prove it out on this new battery. Then also I'm going to move this battery from here and I'm going to move it there and replace those lead acid batteries with that. So I'm also going to briefly show you how to crimp your cables. You can use a hammer crimp. 
looks like this. And you basically put it down on concrete and smack down with a rubber mallet. I have upgraded to this hydraulic crimper. It's really easy to use. This valve, you just close that. It allows this to close. These are like 40 bucks on eBay. Get some cheap, cheap Chinese no-name brand. It works fine. 10 ton press. I, I don't really know if it will be, but I don't care. It seems to work for me. I'm going to recrimp this poorly crimped cable here. But uh, it's already crimped. But I'm going to just recrimp it because I had used a hammer crimp on it. I'm going to kind of crimp it a little bit excessively. And that's it. Now I've got a really nicely crimped cable. It's a crime to cut it off, but unfortunately I need to. These are eight gauge. So the reason this would be bad for a solid core, a single solid wire would be because if you nick copper, it'll break apart. But because this is multi-stranded, even if I nick some of the outer copper, the inner copper will stay good. Okay, so that looks good. I'm now gonna just crimp this in a line. Doing a bit of jaw closing this time. Now, this is the Anderson connector. This is good for 50 amps. This is only a 20 amp charge line. That one's a 40 amp charge line, but I got uh, different configurations of wire. So now, this will go into the minus. So it needs to go in like this. It'll just kind of push itself in and lock. And now there it is. Now, basic connector. There it is. And there you have it. The Anderson connector. Oh, and uh, how you use the Renegies are, you've got little two sense wires. Now, these are supposed to be the load, and you can switch the load on and off. But really, it's only good for running like a small relay. So these two wires, I have them run over to that switch unit, which is basically identical to the Spartan unit that I showed you before. It's still labeled for the lead acid batteries that I used to use. Um, again, this, the high point is 16.3 volts and the low point is um, below 15 volts. And you can see 15.2 volts there. If I switch the load off down here with this, that'll actually turn that entire device off uh, that blue box when I switch load back on you see the power came on and it's switching to batteries which is basically going through that inverter through these voltage adapters which are basically DC DC chargers but I use them as voltage converters from 15 volts to 12 volts since the 15 volts from the lithium-ion battery is too high voltage for a normal 12 volt uh, inverters like Renegies. They should have made them so that they could handle 16 or 17 volts in, but for some reason they didn't. So I have to put all those Victrons in between. Basically, you have to record voltage and current and amp hours and kilowatt hours um, to construct your charge and discharge curves. Here I'm showing a time lapse of the big battery, which is uh, made from um, one set of batteries. And then here's the smaller battery, what I got for it. The bigger battery was seems to be much higher quality, and I got 4 kilowatt hours in it, even though it's only twice the size of the 1.5 kilowatt hour battery. So that's a, it's a, a surprise.